I, I'm going to talk a little bit about the project that we've been working on here at the research station. And, uh, and we were very fortunate to get this funded through the NRCS through a conservation innovation grant. And, uh, and the NRCS has been a great partner to work with on this project over the years. And pretty understanding on my lack of timeliness on my reports, I must say. And uh, what I want to do today is talk a little bit about civil pasture establishment, a little bit about what we did in this project, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And, uh, and then after lunch, we're going to go out and we're going to take a look at it, and we're going to let some, some foresters lead some of the discussions that will hopefully be a little bit more oriented towards timber management and, and what we're seeing in this stand. And JB is going to talk a little bit after lunch about infrastructure for rotational stocking within silvo pasture systems. So this has been quite an exciting project for us here, here at the research station. And it, it's kind of all come together. And I, I'd like to start out with this picture. And um, this is kind of the original silvo pasture group I put together for this project. And, uh, and we've got other people that have helped us from Virginia Tech too. But we have this group here, and there's JB and our local forester, Kirby Wolfuck. And there's a small ruminant specialist from Virginia State, and, and Tom Ward, who's going to speak to us out in the field today. Um, and then Kevin Ogles and, and Todd Grove from the Department of Forestry. And I kind of put this group together and, and visited with them about this project, and about what we wanted to do with this silvo pasture, and kind of got their input from the very start. And, and one thing about silvo pastures is it's really interdisciplinary, and, and that's important to recognize from the very start. I don't have all the skill set to work on this project. I need people like Kirby Wolfuck and, and Todd and, and Tom to help get me moving in the right direction. And understanding that and, and tapping those resources that you're meeting today um, is, is probably one of the most important parts of this meeting is that you just make these connections so that you'll know who to ask these questions to. So with this project, we had several objectives. And, and the first one was to demonstrate the establishment of pine and hardwood silvo pastures in, in the Mid-Atlantic region. Uh, and, and like you, I had many questions from an agronomic standpoint in terms of this trying to wrap my mind around planting a crop that's going to take 30 or 40 years to mature. You know, guys that work in forestry, that's not so much of an issue for them. But for me, that's used to planting something this season, harvesting it this season, or maybe the next season, you know, waiting so long for that mature crop is, is, is difficult for me to get my mind around. So that's where our foresters really come in to kind of calm me down. Um, we want to demonstrate, the second objective was to demonstrate the use of managed grazing in silvo pasture systems. As I said earlier, this is really a critical part of silvo pasture systems. This idea that we're going to just turn animals into a woodlot, that's not a silvo pasture. It's that managed grazing that makes it a silvo pasture. And that's going to help keep a healthy sod in those silvo pastures. It's going to help mitigate problems with compaction and damage to tree roots by having a, a a managed grazing system in place. And then probably the most important part of this project was to, to create an educational resource. So I, I probably, if I, if I had to guess how many groups have come through and looked at our Silvo Pastor project this year, it's probably half a dozen or, or eight or so different groups of people and students and um, educators have come, come through to look at this project. And, and this, this meeting is part of this project, bringing all you together and, and having this resource here. And this is not a, a short-term resource. This is a long-term resource. Um, so we're going to follow this project through, hopefully, over a decade as, as we move through. And, and giving opportunities to educate professionals that work with, with producers is really important, whether they're conservation, forestry, or agricultural professionals. So just a little bit about, about the experiment. This, the CIG projects are, are really focused on demonstration. And, um, but, but we managed to set this demonstration project up in a way that we had two replications. So, so we do have a valid experimental design here, uh, random complete block design with two replications. In our treatments in this, or 
our treatments that we're demonstrating is taking a, um, a pine stand that's, that's mature and then thinning it in establishing silvopasture. So that's what I call kind of the instant silvopasture approach. And then we did the same thing with the hardwood stand. And we have kind of a unique piece of property that you'll see this afternoon where we had a, about, it's 40 acres and about half was in a so predominantly hardwood and half was in predominantly pine. It's not, not perfect. There's some, some mixture of, of pine and hardwoods, but it's, it's pretty close to good, as good as you would expect in a naturally occurring situation. So we, we take these two and we thin them, and then we establish silvopastures. And, and the other one that we wanted to demonstrate was we go in and we harvest that stand of trees, and then we come back and we replant into a silvopasture configuration with grass between the rows of trees. And, and you'll get to see all this this afternoon. And, and please don't think it's perfect because it's not perfect by any means. And um, we, we've made mistakes and we'll talk about those mistakes and we'll talk about the successes too as we go along the way. And then we had a control which was just a clear cut and we went straight into grass with that control. And this is the area this, that we were talking about. So this is about 40 acres, it's on the research station. Um, kind of in our northwest corner of the research station. We took this area that's 40 acres, we divided it down the center. This is predominantly hardwoods in this area, and this was predominantly pines over here. So this is our, our thinned hardwood stands here, thin pine stands here. These pink blocks were clear cut, well both blocks on the ends were clear cut, and then we um, established rows of pine trees in here, and I'll tell you how we did that in, in a few minutes. And, um, and then these yellow blocks or these lighter blocks on the end are, are straight to pasture control treatment. Now, one thing that we did that was kind of unique with this project which is we, we really took time in that first summer we went in there and we took what I call a snapshot of that ecosystem. And, and it was a lot of work, I'll tell you that, uh, especially for my students. And, uh, we went in and we sampled all the different components within that ecosystem. We looked at insects, not just insects. We looked at daytime flying insects, nighttime flying insects. We looked at insects that are dwelling in the leaf litter and, and so on. Um, and we were fortunate to have Paul Sepner, an entomologist, help us with that. We looked at soil, detailed soil chemistry, N, P, K, carbon, nitrogen in the soil. We looked at leaf litter, how much leaf litter was there present. What was in that leaf litter? Was there macroinvertebrates in that leaf litter? We looked at the tree communities. We were very fortunate that John Munsell from the uh, Virginia Tech um, hooked us up with a couple rising seniors in um, forestry. And they came down and did a very detailed survey of, of our area before we touched the first tree. And we looked at soil nematodes. And, and we always have a negative connotation when we say nematodes because we talk about soybean cyst nematode and tobacco cyst nematode but there's lots of free living nematodes in the soil that are, are uh, a good part of a healthy ecosystem also. So that, that's Paul and Brad and I've got a lot of pictures in here. Um, that's Paul and, and Brad are, are chemists and they're setting up a malaise trap and that's the sample daytime flying insects. And, and Paul, by the way, there was so much insect diversity, he's still separating those samples from several years ago within there. Very, very tedious work. Every night he's in here going through samples. And uh, this is the uh, light trap to sample day, nighttime flying insects. Uh, we had to run it off of uh, car batteries. This is sampling macroinvertebrates in the leaf litter. So we actually laid quad rats down. We collected that, that leaf litter. We put that leaf litter on pieces of plastic and then went through it piece by piece and collected the macroinvertebrates in that leaf litter. If you can look in this picture, someone here is digging a soil pit. We took a cubic foot of soil. It doesn't sound like much soil, but, but when you lay it down on a, a piece of plastic and you sort through it several times to get the macroinvertebrates out, it's a lot more soil than you think. And uh, in, in this was a, a really gave us a really nice snapshot of this ecosystem before we disturbed anything. And what we're going to do now is after, 
after we go through this conversion process into silvopasture, we'll let the system settle down. It's in a state of disturbance now. And then we'll come back and we'll resample this ecosystem again to see what kind of changes switching from one land use to another has, has caused within this system. So just some of our uh, initial preliminary results, our predominant tree species were oak species in the, um, in the hardwood area, and we had about 119 square feet of basal area per acre. And in the pine area, of course, it was loblolly pine, as you would expect, with the basal area of about 168 square feet per acre. Um, our soil chemistry at a, a sampling depth of 10 centimeters, so that's our traditional sampling depth for uh, soil samples, um, was uh, on average 4.88 pH. So this is a really important number for everybody in here to realize that, you know, traditionally our forested land, you know, is not really amended with, with nutrients like lime and fertilizer. This is not going to support improved forage growth. So if, if we're thinking about doing silvopastures, we've really got to make people understand that it's going to be essential for them to amend that soil so that we can get the pH and the nutrient levels up to a level that will support improved forage growth, or else we're just going to have some broom straw in there. And, and that's not what we're after. We're after a good, healthy stand of forage that's going to protect that soil and provide a, a nutritional resource for our livestock. Um, phosphorus, two parts per million was our soil test, and that's in the very low range. Very traditional, that's exactly where it should be for a, a native forest stand in the south side of Virginia. But we've got to adjust that up to support that improved forage growth. Potassium's always a little bit surprising for me. We've cleared some other land at the station, and it's in that kind of that low minus or low plus, medium minus range in terms of soil test levels. Still need to add some potassium to that system, but it's, it's um, more abundant in our soils than, than I would have expected. And then we, we measured nitrogen concentration in the soil at 0.04% and um, carbon at 2.46% uh, in our soil samples. And we did that with a um, Elementar. Um, it's uh, where we actually burn the sample and it measures the... Uh, nitrogen and carbon released. This is total microbial biomass, and we worked with a guy on campus um, to get this done. I, we didn't do that here. We don't have this capability, but we, we did take soil samples, and we took it to him, and, and um, I can't remember the method that he used. It's in my notes, but I can't remember the exact method. But what, what he found was is that uh, we had 28,300 pounds of biomass per acre. And that sounds like a lot, but when you think about a, an acre for a slice of, um, of soil, that's going to be about 2 million pounds. So, so this is, you know, less than a percent or about a, percent, a little over a percent is in microbial biomass. We, had, uh, we found 15 species of parasitic and other free-living nematodes in the soil that we took, and uh, we had those identified at campus. Not all the nematodes were even identified. Um, we, they can identify nematodes they commonly see, but some of the other free-living nematodes were, were not even really identified, just saying that we had them present in the sample. And our most abundant insects in this initial sampling were camel crickets, pill bugs, harvestmen, flatback millipedes, and field crickets is um, what we found. And we had... Of course, we had the uh, traps for the flying insects, but we also put out traps in the soil for ground-dwelling insects, and they were essentially a cup of antifreeze, and, and the insects just kind of wandered into that, and then we would collect them. So here, here's our silvopasture team, and one of the questions that I asked when we started this is, how many trees do we leave per acre? And... Um, Surprisingly, I couldn't get a good number out of them. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, it depends, it depends. You know, but at some point you've got to make a decision about how many trees we're going to leave. And, and, and we had lots of discussion and, and, uh, and John Munsell was down from campus and, and John Fike and, and we have Todd and Kevin Ogles and, and JB there and Kirby Wolfuck and, and we went around and round about how many trees to leave and... and uh, 
we had some, some three-dimensional graphs that we were thinking about using, you know, that had an X, Y, and Z axis. And I, I just had a hard time myself visualizing the data on that graph. And, and I, I looked at that and I said, well, that's something a producer's probably never going to use, you know, to make a decision with. And um, so, so what we decided was it wasn't the number of trees necessarily, but the basal area is kind of what we focused in on when we thought about what, what we should do. So because I couldn't get a good number out of these guys, I had to call in the big gun. And, and Sid, Sid has, uh, Sid Brantley's on the program later. He's, he's our, let me look at his title here. He is our national range and grassland specialist in Washington, D.C. And, and to be honest with you, I never thought I would see Sid in Washington. But, um, but he's there, and, and we're very fortunate to have him there. And he's been in a number of different states over the years and, and worked with Silvo Pasture in a number of different states. And he's going to give you some real-world experience uh, with, with that, with Silvo Pastures in a number of different states in the southeastern United States. But, but Sid was at a meeting that John had put together in Keysville. Some of you may have gone to that meeting. It was a, a Silva pasture in service in Keysville. And he was nice enough to come to the research station after that, the in service was over. And um, we went out and we, we sat down in the woods and we looked at it. And I said, all right, what, what should I do here? And, um, and we got pretty good advice from him. He said, you know... I don't think I'd take more than about half the basal area. And that's kind of what we settled on doing. We, we, we said our target is going to be removing about half the basal area that's present in those pastures. And, and we knew what that was because we had that survey done by the forestry students. So we worked with a consulting forester local here. And um, we, we said, this is what we want to do. Can you mark the trees for us? because I have no idea how to ma mark 50% basal area in a, in a standing timber stand. Um, so he went in, it was almost like he was in a trance, and, and he would walk through there and he'd paint a blue line on one tree and walk to another one and paint another blue line. And then came, came the, the harvesting part. So we, we put blue on the trees that we didn't want to leave. And we, we worked, we, we bid this out like any other forestry sale. And the high bidder went to a guy in, in North Carolina and he came up and he was, um, he was good to work with. He was a, 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 good, uh, a good forester. And, um, and we helped him understand how important it was to us to leave those trees, the blue paint, by putting in a, a little penalty if I saw any leave on a truck. It was three times the value of the tree. So that helped him understand. Then we also had a, a clause in that said if he damaged tree, tr trees past an acceptable level that he had to pay a penalty. So, so he was real careful and, and, and worked real well with us. And, and I didn't see any blue paint leave. That doesn't mean it didn't happen. But, but he did. I, I feel like he did a really good job. And what was interesting about his harvesting operation is he came in first with this bunch of feller and he kind of gathered up all this little underbrush stuff and chipped it. And, and then he came back and he started to harvest the actual trees, the saleable timber trees. And he, he was hauling chips away, so he, he did leave some residue, but it wasn't, it wasn't as much as some, some logging operations leave. I think he did a, overall a pretty good job. So this whole aspect of working with your forester is something that we haven't really talked about today, but it's probably really, really important, whether it's your logger or your forester. Getting them to understand what you want to do is really important, and that's going to take um, good communication and sometimes a, a logger that has a little bit of an, more of an open mind. So this is kind of what the stand looked like immediately after thinning. And we're going to look at this today, and we've, we've uh, since applied lime and fertilizer, and I'll show you how we did that in, in the seeded grass into this uh, stand. This is on the uh, right side of that map where we have predominantly a, um, a pine silva pasture. So this was, was our pre-thinning basal area, our post-thinning basal area for our pine and hardwood area. And we were at about 120 square feet for our basal area in the pine. The post-thinning was 40. So we missed our, we missed our target. And, and 
Is it the end of the world? Pro- probably not. I, I would have liked to see it a little heavier, but, but it, we, we ended up around 32% for our hardwood and about 27% post thinning um, basal area for our pine stands. We really wanted to stay closer to 50, but, but this is kind of where theory and practice comes together. You know, in theory, we wanted 50%. In practice, we didn't quite get there. And, and I guess one thing that we all need to understand is that we try to do things the best we can. Sometimes they're not perfect. So, and we can talk about the consequences of this this afternoon when we go out. This is um, probably the most controversial part of the whole project. And, and it's not because of the actual process, but it's because of how much it costs. And, um, and, and this is important to remember. So I made a conscious decision, right or wrong, and, and you can criticize me for it or, or not, but, but I said we, we want to be able to apply lime and fertilizer, and, and we want to be able to, to get a forage stand established, um, and we want to be able to maintain that forage stand after it's established. And to do that, we can't have stumps there. And so we went in and we hired Billy Pepper and he came in and he mulched the area for us. Mulched the stumps down to the soil surface. Pretty, pretty good job. He didn't get much below the soil surface in most cases, but down to the soil surface. And we told him we wanted to be careful not to damage the root system of the, um, ex- the trees that were still there. Um, so we did that. And, and that's Pee Wee, he ran the mulcher for us, and, and there was a cost associated with this, and that cost was substantial, $1,000 an acre. And, and I know everybody's saying, oh, man, how can you afford to do that? And, and uh, I'd argue if you want to maintain your pastures and get a good establishment, you, you've, got to, you've got to be able to get in there with some kind of equipment um, to do work. And... In the big picture, if you're looking at cleaning land up, so if I'm going just from a, a, a piece of cutover land into, into a pasture, I'm going to pay that much or more for cleanup, most likely. You know, um, probably more if it's a conventional grubbing and, and putting them into piles and burning the stumps. It's probably going to be more than $1,000 per acre. When we did a comparison several years ago, we, we found that about, I guess it would be about 10 years ago, mulching was $850 at that time, and in conventional clearing was $1,450. So there was a substantial savings even with mulching at that time, and both did an adequate job of getting that land cleaned up. So we're going to kind of keep track of our costs as we go through this. And, and then we, we, um, we came in and we, we dissed that mulched area one time, and then we, we uh, called the co-op and we came and we put three tons of lime down to kind of get us up into that, that range that will support forage growth, improved forage growth. It's going to be a high lime requirement when your soil pH is, you know, 4.8, starting pH. And that costs us about $120 an acre. And, and this is not really a... This is not really a um, something that we can decide not to do. I mean, if you want to support improved forage growth, you've got to make an investment in fertility initially. That investment can be prorated over a decade, but it's, it's got to be there, and your pH has got to be about six to support that improved forage growth. Then we applied fertilizer, and initially as part of this project, we were going to use an organic uh, fertilizer source, uh, broiler litter, but I couldn't source it at that time. So, and, and that's the problem with organic sources is sometimes they have a lot, sometimes they don't have a lot. And we just fell into that piece where I, I could not source burr litter at that time. We were going to use, uh, our, our backup was biosolids, but, but the DEQ has taken biosolids application over and it's, it's much more difficult to, um, we, we couldn't get the permitting in a timely manner to use it on this research project. Um, so we went with commercial fertilizer. We put down uh, 75 pounds of nitrogen, 175 pounds of P205, and 150 pounds of uh, potash. And then because we were doing the spring seeding, we put a little pearl millet in with the fertilizer and just spread it on the land to c- kind of 
have a summer nurse crop for our cool season grass establishment. That cost us about $180 an acre. And I'm going to sum all these up later. Um, so then we came back and we used a, a heavy ag disc offset to, to incorporate that lime and fertilizer into the, into the soil. And we came back almost immediately after incorporating it and seeded our improved forages. And um, we used a brilliant seeder. So, we, so we've got a prepared seed bed and we've got two rollers on this seeder. A roller just like the one you see in the back, but it's in the front. It presses the soil down. We have a metering box in between the two rollers that drops the seed down in between the rollers and the bottom roller presses that seed in contact with the soil. This is probably one of the best seeding methods for, for um, small seeded forage crops. And, and um, I, I put Berenberg's, Berenberg's logo on there because they donated all the seed for this project and, and I wanted to recognize them. And, I, I sat down with them and they, they were interested in, in getting some of their, their uh, varieties out here for a while and I called them up and, and, and told them what we were doing with the silbo pasture and they agreed to donate the seed. And I sent them a list of what I, what I would like to see in that forage mixture and they sent me back a list and said, well, we'd really like to try this or that in it. So we kind of worked up this silbo pasture. Uh, I call it a premium silbo pasture mixture. And, uh, and it's got tall fescue in it as kind of the base forage, and, as you would expect. And, but, but not Kentucky 31. We used a novel endophyte tall fescue. And a novel endophyte tall fescue is a tall fescue that has an endophyte in it, but that endophyte does not produce the toxins that negatively impact livestock performance. Um, I think we lose a lot of production in livestock because we, we have not really... Um, done a good job at renovating these uh, Kentucky 31 pastures with some of these improved forage species like a novel endophyte tall fescue. We included orchard grass in this mixture, and these are the seeding rates over here, a total seeding rate of about 30, 33 and a half pounds of seed. And then we've got some alfalfa in there, uh, red clover, white, white clover, a ladino clover, some improved white clover. Um, Perennial ryegrass was something that they wanted to include in this mixture. And they, they have a perennial ryegrass, Remington, and it, it actually has a beneficial, what they call a beneficial endophyte in it. And they were really interested to see how it performed this far south. So we included that in the mixture. And then they have a meadow fescue, which I traditionally think of as being more northern adapted, but they wanted to try it in this, in this uh, uh, mixture. So this was the mixture that we used, a pretty complex mixture, and had about uh, 33 pounds of total seed per acre. $130 for just a seeding mixture. It, and I know people cringe at that, but, but when you look at long-term past, perennial pasture production, seed's the cheapest thing you can buy. And, and, and that's an investment up front. And if it's productive and the animals do well, you'll more than regain that in animal productivity as you move forward. So this is kind of our cost summary from, from all these different pieces of this whole puzzle. So, so I figured we, we mulched it. That was $1,000 an acre. That's our big, big uh, guy in the, in the pot here. $30 an acre to disc it twice. Um, we limed, limed it. At uh, $120 per acre, fertilizer $180. I would have much rather used about um, two to three tons of row litter on here than a commercial fertilizer if it was available, and that would have brought that cost down to about $100, $100 an acre. And um, and then our seed and seeding, I figured uh, uh, we had our seed cost plus a, a cost of se dragging that seeder over an acre of land, so about $145. So so the cost was $1,475 an acre to kind of get that forage established on that land. Alan? This for both the reconstructed pasture as well as the existing Yes. Yes. Um, the reconstructed silver pasture will have one additional cost in it, which was the planting of the trees, which was about $75 an acre or something. Fairly inexpensive. So that's kind of our base cost that we're working with. If, if we could avoid that mulching, then it would really become more feasible to convert this land into silvo pasture. And so what I'm looking for from you today is a discussion on how to avoid that mulching and if we can do that. If we're patient and um, 
and we've got five or six years and, and we've got predominantly pine trees, we can kind of let those stumps kind of break down. In the five or six years, we can probably disc up a lot of those stumps. Hardwoods, that's another story, you know. A hardwood stump may be there in 20 years. So, so we need to think about how we can deal with those from a practical standpoint. Um, the cows don't mind the stumps. It's the equipment that minds the stumps. The co-op, you know, if you tell the co-op, well, I want you to come spread lime in my silvo pasture and I've got six inch stumps in it, you think they're gonna come? I kind of doubt it. You know, they, they did enough complaining about my silvo pasture where I mulched the stumps. So, so pra from a practical standpoint, we need to think about how we can manage those stumps to get that silvo pasture. This is just a, a photograph from June of uh, this year. We seeded the pastures in April and, um, and this is June 9th. And this is a group that we had um, from the Department of Conservation and Recreation that we took on a tour there this summer. And this is uh, mid-June. This is the stand, as you can see, we, most of the species that we see just showed up. We've got clovers in there, alfalfa, orchard grass, tall fescue, and, and probably some ryegrass, but I, I couldn't identify it at this stage in time. There's JB standing in a silvo pasture in late June. Um, that's the pine side. We did not get the pine side seeded in the spring. We ran out of time, so we, um, we had that pearl millet cover crop, and that's what you're seeing in that photograph. And we came back and we got that seeded about, oh, two and a half weeks ago here, and so it's coming up now. And we'll take a look at that this afternoon. It's for our field day on, in late July. Uh, we got, had gone through and had clipped the pearl millet to open the canopy up a little bit and let some light in for those cool season grasses that were below that. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about the last treatment. That's clear cut to silvo pasture. And... Um, Again, it kind of follows that same thing. Somehow we've got to re re remove debris and, and get those stumps down. Lime, P, and K, just like we talked about before. Um, one thing that we have to think about is when we replant to a silvopasture configuration is the row spacing that we use. Do we use two rows together? Do we use three rows or four rows of pine trees together? Um, what are the benefits of doing that? Do we use a single row? So the most popular configurations are generally for are single row or double row configurations. And we kind of decided to use a double row configuration. Um, and then uh, how do we manage those forages? And we kind of had some of that discussion already for the first two to four years, let those trees get up and get moving before we put livestock in on those. And we can protect them with temporary fencing. It's kind of a pain. Or we could maybe make hay off of those alleyways for that first two to four years. Um, or maybe we do nothing. Maybe we just accept some mortality in, in those trees that we planted uh, with livestock grazing them. And we can kind of manage that mortality if we're managing grazing and we get those animals in quick and out quick. All right, so, so when, when we replanted, I had this grand idea in my mind that we, we used a tree planting crew that we were going to um, that I was going to tell them the configuration I wanted planted and they were going to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, look at them shaking his head, no. Well, when they showed up and I was the only one that spoke English, you know, I, I kind of threw that plan out the window and, and kind of adjusted on the go. So, so what we ended up doing was uh, we ended up saying, just, let's just plan a 10 by 10 configuration. The whole thing, 10 by 10. And, and that's something that these guys understood and could do. And... Uh, and we did that, and, and um, I'll tell you what, I, I had dreaded planting the trees, but this was the best decision we've ever made is to have a tree planting crew come in because that's not the kind of work I want to do personally. So, and, and so we had them come in, and in, in a couple hours they were done with our little job. Um, so we used the double row arrangement, and, and, um, and this is where the other... The, the other uh, reality came to, to roost, and, and that was, I remember Kirby Wolfuck says, well, they'll plant the trees in rows, so just choose two rows and, and uh, go on from there. But they, they didn't plant them in straight rows. They <laughs> Maybe they look straight to a forester, I don't know, but to an agronomist, they weren't straight. And, uh, 
And so I sent, I sent Kelly out. They gave the presentation this morning. I said, all right, lay them out. I said, just put two rows in there and, and then lay a, uh, we'll vary the space between the, the row sets. And she came in and she was so frustrated that she was using foul language <laughs> with, with what I was trying to have her do. And uh, so we went out and we, and we gave up on that real quick. And, and what we said is we'll just lay it out and, um, and, and we'll capture trees. We'll lay out a 12 foot spacing essentially from, they were 10 foot set, we'll lay out 12 feet and, and we'll just leave that 12 foot and then we're gonna vary this space between the double sets from 20 to 60 foot. So we did 20, 40, 60, 20, 40, 60 to look at um, different area of forage between those double row sets. And, and from a forester standpoint, maybe our, maybe our plantings look okay. They look weedy to me now, but I guess that's the way they're supposed to look in this initial establishment phase. So, so these, what we did is we just came in, we laid this out just like this, Kelly and I did, and then we, we came in with a disc and disc this up in the center, and that's where we established the forage this fall in between those sets of trees. So... That's just uh, uh, disking the seed bed between the rows of trees. And then we came in and we planted just like we did before with the brilliant seeder, same seeding rate, same lime, same fertilizer. And one of the questions earlier is what, what impact is this going to have on timber growth? I, I don't, from my standpoint, I think it's probably going to enhance tree growth because we're building fertility in that soil. You know, that's fertility that those trees never had before. And I'm sure there's some research on that. I know they've done biosolid applications on trees, and, and I'm, not, I'm not familiar with that literature, but I would expect that that enhanced that tree growth over time. I just want to end with a, a slide of, uh, these are all the contacts that, that um, you can use. And this is kind of our silver pasture team, and there's probably people missing off of here, but... But it's a big one, and it's kind of headed up by John Fike that did the fir first presentation in there. And, and we're very happy to have Gabe coming on to the research station here in Blackstone. He's going to be a great addition to our team here, into the Silva Pasture team statewide. And there's Adam Downing, who's here today, and Greg Fry, who gave the presentation, and Miller. Adam's over in Charlotte County, and, um, and then people from Tech. And J.B. Daniel from the NRCS has been really a, a driver with this Silvo Pasture CIG initiative, and and um, and then we've got our graduate students Kelly and and uh, working on the project in the Department of Forestry, Kirby and and Todd. They're all great partners, and and this is a great interdisciplinary group that's kind of putting all these pieces together for for a system that's not so straightforward as a monoculture. This is a great reference if. And it's downloadable on the internet. It's um, Silvo Pastures in, in the southeastern United States. Really applicable to here. And uh, um, I'd encourage you, if, if you're interested in Silvo Pastures, to go ahead and download it. And the link's on this slide. And we are recording all these presentations. We're going to post them on the web on our YouTube website, VT Forages. So you'll be able to watch them again if you want to. And then I just want to thank all the partners, with, not with just this program, but, but with this whole project. And, and we've got Virginia State has been an active part of Kelly's research, too. Greg Fry was at Virginia State prior, and he really um, helped us get Kelly's shade study going. And, and we've got the uh, U.S. Forest Service and Virginia Department of Forestry and Southern SARE. Kelly's funding for her graduate program has come from um, USDA Southern SARE grant. Uh, Baron Brug Seed and, of course, Virginia Tech and the NRCS for, for funding this Conservation Innovation Grant. That's all I've got, guys. Is there any questions? We've, we've got a few minutes for, um, am I on time or off time? Okay. So is there any questions? Yes, and, and that's a question of whether we should have used, and it's not too late to go back in and put multiple species within those rows if we wanted to. Um, we used the improved variety. I have it in my office. It's from North Carolina. I, I would expect so, but I would defer to a forester to answer that question. The, 
Right. We, we just happened to get a variety out of North Carolina because that's what that company that was doing our replanting had in stock. So, um, I know that income may have not even come back to the station at all. It might have gone into the, the whatever general Virginia. Yeah. So, so uh, if I would estimate from that 40 acre block, we, we had about $95,000. Is, is how many acres? For that 40 acre block. So, um, so yeah, it would have covered the cost of establishment. Part of, that was, uh, part of that was clear cut. Part of that was clear. That's right. Part was clear cut. So, twenty acres were clear cut and twenty acres were thin. You know, I I do not know the history of that pine stand. To be honest with you. It, it's been there since the station's been here, and we took this. The station was established in 1974, so it was there prior to that. I, I don't think it was well, I, I don't know, I'll defer to a forester. I don't think it was well managed. Tom? We can talk about the stumping thing some more, I guess, in the field, but the, the one project, actually similar in a lot of ways in Missouri, because I think they did about 50 acres, and, and they wanted quick results. And I don't know if they, if they factored in the um, timber, timber receipts or not, but, and I, don't quote me on this, because I, I have to look it up. I think their net costs were closer to four or five hundred but they didn't mulch the site. Right. They stumped it low, and I don't know, I don't do timber sale contracts, but I don't know how much leverage you have with the logger and how low you can get a stump. But they apparently got it low enough. I've got, unfortunately, I didn't bring my PowerPoint, but I've got pictures of them moving around in the stand with a um, lime, uh, fertilizer buggy, liming and fertilizing yeah. the site. Um, so they got a tractor, and a buggy in there, and we're able to move around right. over the stumps, probably slowly. And then, they, well, before that, they did a prescribed burn to try and reduce. They, the resident, yeah. Log, and then they did a burn, and then they uh, lime fertilized and broadcast seeded, and then I think they dragged the seed in. And I didn't see what they used to drag the seed in, but they pulled something behind a tractor and incorporated the seed. Yeah. So and, I... And I yeah, in, in a lot of forage establishment is is um, is just getting timely rainfall after seeding. Yeah, <laughs> so, um, yeah. yeah, so I, I think there's opportunities to do that. And we were at Mr. Poindexter's farm a month ago for a field day, and he actually has some modified equipment that has higher clearance to get over over stumps. But not everybody has that, so that you just have to take that kind of thing into consideration. That's something that he was able to buy or make or, or something for that specific use. But definitely the stumping is an issue because people yeah. are always saying, do we push out the stumps? Do we, what do we do about the stumps? I, I don't know. That's, that's something we can talk about this afternoon is how we handle those stumps. And, and I don't have a good answer for you. And, well, what I typically tell people is low stump it as low as possible and then try to work around it. Yeah. Easy to say, right? Yeah, that's right. All right, so JB has something he wants to do right